Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. One meeting place for lover and husband? Today we have a story with just such a plot. Enjoy watching it. Donna and I have been married for eight years. We graduated from college together and got married a year later. We both have good jobs and are saving as much money as we can for our first home. No children yet, I want them, but Donna just isn't interested in being a mother in any sense of the word. This seemed to be the only disagreement in our marriage. We had our first intimate when we were in college and were always open to trying new things, though within certain limits, nothing perverted. Our intimate life was active and fairly constant until about four months ago. Bird watching brought us together in college. We both loved being out in the open looking for elusive species we hadn't seen yet. We met on an organized birding trip and found ourselves enjoying each other's company. It was nice to have someone to go out with, and we both liked the same things. Our first intim was in the forest, and it turned out to be Donna's favorite place to engage in carnal pleasures. She has shoulder-length brown hair and dark Mediterranean skin. She has small, firm, and perfectly round chest without the slightest sag. Perhaps she did not strive to have children because she was afraid of losing her beautiful form. Another thing I like about Donna is that she has a lot of thick dark hair. She was hesitant to shave off excess body hair because she was afraid it would grow thicker again. I was fine with this because I thought it added to her charm. I love this woman deeply. For a while, I was engrossed in my work and probably worked too much overtime. Donna got home from work much earlier than me. She would change clothes and head to one of our favorite birding spots before it got dark. She always kept a diary of the birds she saw. Usually, there was nothing interesting or unusual, but she felt it was important to keep good records. She was almost obsessed with it. I would come home after dark and usually fall asleep on the couch while we watched TV. I simply worked too much and was not a good companion or husband. After a few days without intimate, I expected her to become active. On the contrary, she seemed relieved that I was not trying to make any physical contact with her. That's when I started to worry. I never played team sports growing up. My parents tried to interest me in all sorts of activities with other kids my age. The problem was that I had a very bad temper. I would fly off the handle at the slightest provocation and lash out at any child who made me angry. By the time I graduated from high school, I had learned to keep it under control. My wife didn't know about this problem. She never seemed to do anything to push me over the edge. That's probably why she attracted me. My parents never told her about this. I rearranged my workload and schedule so I could have more time with Donna. I explained to my boss that I was overextended, and he completely understood. Now I have to try to improve my relationship with my wife. I had no reason to suspect her of infidelity, but I felt her displeasure. Donna, we can spend a week or two somewhere quiet and romantic. I feel like we haven't spent a minute together lately. Maybe three days off, Brian but I don't think either of us wants to be away from work longer than that. I think it's very important that we stick to a plan to save up for a down payment on a house. Your rework helped create a foundation, and I would not want us to retreat. Home is very important, but I feel like we don't spend enough time together. When I get home from work, I'm too tired to be in good company, and we spend the weekend doing housework and shopping. Dear, it seems to me that you are making a mountain out of a molehill. I'd be more than happy to take a short trip to somewhere close by, but I'm just not ready to go on a full-on vacation. I guess I'm just too worried. I want to make sure I'm doing everything I can to make you happy. I'm happy, Brian. I'll let you know if things go south so we can put a stop to it. We have enough real problems without fictional ones. I hope you're right. I don't want you to have a wandering eye. When I said this, she winked at me slightly. Well, this was my attempt to make my marriage better. I didn't say anything about my new work schedule that night. I made a weak attempt at intim, but she had a headache. Before I went to bed, I checked Donna's journal. Apparently, she left the house regularly. I have a small Honda 250 Rebel motorcycle that I love. It's fast, quiet, and easy to use. That day, I drove it to work. Donna usually got home around 4. Around 4, at approximately this time, I told Marge, my secretary, that I would be in the archives for the rest of the day. 
I asked her to call me on my mobile when she got ready to go home. There are no landlines in the basement, and no one usually works there. I went out the fire exit at the back of the building and put a small wedge in the door to keep it from locking. Five minutes later, I was parked on the street next to the house. My wife came home at the usual time, changed clothes, and ten minutes later, she was at the birdwatching site. I knew where she was going, so I didn't follow her too closely. Ten minutes later, her Volvo was parked in the Rainbow Mountain Main Trail parking lot, a black BMW stood nearby. We spent a lot of time in this park, so I knew the trails well. Having parked the motorcycle among the trees, I walked along another path. I took my time and tried not to make noise. Years of birdwatching have given me an edge in this area. Every few minutes, I stopped and scanned the area with binoculars. It got a little rough towards the top of the mountain, the trails were marked, but they were near dangerous ledges. This has been good for hawk sightings, especially this time of year. You could see the valley for miles, and everything was beautiful unless you looked down. I couldn't help it, I stopped and aimed my binoculars at the valley, looking for early arrivals of hawks. It was wonderful. And then I heard giggling. The forest was thick enough to make it easy to hide if necessary. Of course, this also made it difficult to see someone if they were hiding. My attention was now drawn to the faint sound I heard. It was not constant, so it was difficult to pinpoint. I moved forward slowly, not making a sound and listening very carefully. The yellow flash gave them away, it was the lining of her vest. I found a comfortable spot that allowed me to see clearly and took out my scope. I had binoculars handy, but the scope gave me a much better picture, and there was a camera attached to it. I found a place where I could see clearly, lying prone. I could hide and at the same time observe for a long time without getting tired. It was a very private place, and they didn't have to worry about anyone accidentally finding them. My wife's companion was Clayton Mankey. He joined Donna's company about six months ago. I met him at several corporate events, he was a pretty nice guy, and I really liked him. He had a good wife, quiet but attractive, and two boys of primary school age. I liked his boys, and I regretted that I didn't have a pair just like them. Why would a guy with such a perfect family get involved with my wife? I quickly gathered my things and walked down the path behind her, far enough away that she couldn't see me. I stopped at the Hawk Mountain lookout. It was a flat rock overlooking the valley below. The height was at least 300 feet, a beautiful place but dangerous. I stood looking through binoculars when Clayton appeared along the path. My blood boiled when I saw him, but outwardly I was calm. Hey, what are you looking at? That's a red-tailed hawk feeding its young on top of that pine tree over there. He looked in that direction but saw nothing. Of course, there was nothing to see there. That tree over there, strewn with cones, I haven't seen it yet. He moved a little closer to the edge and leaned over. Then he looked at me again. Do I know you from somewhere? Yes, we have already met. I'm Brian Powers, Anne's husband. His eyes went wide. The last thing he said was, oh damn, as I gently pushed him over the edge. For the next few moments, everything went as if in slow motion. It seemed to take him forever to reach the bottom, although in reality, it was probably about four or five seconds. As I looked over the edge, my cell phone rang. Hey, Marge, what's going on? I'm leaving. Are you going to stay there all day? No, I'm already finishing. I'll be back upstairs in about ten minutes. Okay. I left two letters on your desk that need to be signed. I have to send them in the morning. No problem. Thank you, Marge. See you tomorrow. It took me over ten minutes to get to the office, but it didn't matter since Marge left anyway. Before heading home, I swapped my hiking boots for Oxford's. The boots ended up in a dumpster a few blocks from work. Donna was surprised to see me home so early. Clayton's body was not found until the next day. It was on the evening news, and Donna was upset. He didn't come to work today. Everyone wondered if he was sick, she said, but his wife said that he had not returned home yesterday. What the hell was he doing on Rainbow Mountain? He wasn't into birdwatching or anything like that, was he? Donna faltered slightly. No, I do not think so. 
Did you go there yesterday after work? No, I needed to do some laundry. I wonder if anyone saw anything during the week. There are not many people there. Well, I guess I better get the black suit out of mothballs, I said. Donna glanced at me quickly. She seemed upset because I was a little flighty. Sorry, honey. I know you two work together, and I didn't mean to take his death lightly. That night, I noticed her crying quietly when we went to bed. I said nothing. Two days later, they visited me at work. Hello, I'm Detective Felix Green. Do you have time to answer a few questions for me? No problem. How can I help you, Mr. Powers? Did you know Clayton Mankey? He worked in the same place as my wife. We're not friends or anything, but we've met at a few social events. Is this because of the accident at Rainbow Mountain on Tuesday? We're just trying to make ends meet. That's great, but I don't see how I can help you. It sounds like your wife was close friends with Mr. Mankey, and we just want to make sure you weren't upset about their relationship. What relationships? I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. My wife worked with Clayton Mankey, and that was the extent of their relationship. I see where you're going with this, and I don't like it. If you're going to make statements like that, I hope you have some facts to back it up. I spoke to your wife this morning, Mr. Powers. She was with Clayton Mankey at Rainbow Mountain on Tuesday, just before the accident. This is impossible. I asked her yesterday, and she said she did laundry at home. I don't think she wants you to know about their relationship. Damn it, here we go again. I asked not to make such accusations against my wife. This is not an accusation, Mr. Powers. Your wife told us this morning that she has been dating Clayton Mankey for over three months. How did you meet? We didn't talk about it, and if we did, I wouldn't be comfortable discussing it here. This is something you and your wife must decide for yourselves. Are you trying to say something, or just trying to make me angry? Relax, Mr. Powers. It is not our intention to upset you. We spoke with your secretary, Marge Schumann, and she said you spent most of Tuesday in the basement going through archive files. Not most of the day, just two hours or less. The rest of the time, I was in my office. I left early, around 5.30 or 6. The guard downstairs said you checked out at about a quarter to 6. Like that? I didn't keep track of time. I just wanted to go home to my wife. Your wife said that you returned home around 6 o'clock. The journey is only 10 minutes. She said I was there until the evening. Relax, Mr. Powers, everything is fine. We're just checking a few avenues to make sure nothing is missing. Did you really not know about your wife's relationship with Clayton Mankey? No, but I think it will be the main topic of discussion at the dinner table tonight. Felix Green gave me his business card, apologized, and quietly left. I was beside myself. I swear there was smoke coming out of my ears. I threw the stapler across the room just as Marge walked in. Brian, I hope I didn't say anything bad. I didn't want you to get in trouble, so I just answered their questions as honestly as I could. It's okay, Marge. It seems my wife and I are having some personal problems. You may have to cover for me for the next few days. Looks like I'll be very busy. No problem. I had no intention of solving my problems with Donna. All I wanted was to find a better way to end this marriage. Fortunately, there were no children and we lived in a rented house. I wanted kids badly, but now I was glad Donna said no. It wasn't even 3 o'clock yet, but I packed all my things and walked out the door. Marge nodded understandingly at me as I left. We had $75,000 in change in our household account. I took the $63,000 and walked down the street to the local GM dealer. Two hours later, $58,000 poorer, I left in a yellow Hummer. I decided that I didn't need a new home. I needed extra money to buy gas for the monster. Shortly after, I pulled into the driveway, and Donna came out. What the hell is this? Like this is my new car. I decided that I needed something more sporty. Are you crazy? How the hell are we going to pay for something like this? No problem. I paid for it in cash. Where the hell did you get the money to buy a truck like that? Don't tell me you withdrew money from our house account. Well, 
I don't understand why a single guy needs a house, so I bought a Hummer. A crowd had gathered outside as we entered the house. Donna grabbed my hand. What do you mean by single guy? I think you know the answer to this question. Why should I buy a house with you? Damn, why should I stay with you? Come on, Brian, you're talking like crazy. Calm down and come to your senses, okay, sweetie? Detective Green came to see me today and told me about your relationship with Clayton Mankey. You were with him on Rainbow Mountain, you said you do laundry at home. Would you like to explain? I did not want to make you sad. Clayton and his wife were having problems, and since he was new to town, he had no one to talk to about it. I just gave him a shoulder to cry on. What's wrong with going to Denny's or Starbucks? Why did you need to climb Rainbow Mountain? Clay was very excited and was afraid that he would break down and cry. He didn't want to do this in public. I stood up and poured myself a cup of coffee. Donna sat quietly, waiting for my next move. It was like a little game. I was angry that she even decided to play it. This is all. And you know it. It hurts me that you think so badly of me that you try to do something like that. You and Clayton have been lovers for over three months. You cheated on me, and he cheated on his wife. I'm tired of hearing you make up stories for little girls. Either deal with it like an adult or keep your damn mouth shut. You yourself don't know what you're talking about. Just because you make something up doesn't mean it's true. There was nothing but friendship between Clayton Mankey and me. If you can prove otherwise, go ahead. I had some damn good photos. If I show the photos, I'll have to admit that I was at Rainbow Mountain the day Clay died. My fists were clenched, and the blue vessels in my neck and forehead were bursting. I have very beautiful photographs, Donna. Will this be sufficient proof? Photos of what? Where were the pictures taken? Photos of you having intimate in a motel? Ha! This proves that you are lying. We've never had a night in. Donna froze as she realized what she had just said. Her denial was also an admission. In her quest to prove me wrong, she lost her temper. She never finished her sentence. Her eyes glared at me, and her lower lip trembled with anger. She hated being hit. Oh, I won't talk about this anymore, and you won't get a divorce from me. You can sleep in your new truck because you won't be able to climb into bed with me for a long, long time. Take your dinner and leave me alone. We'll still go to the funeral together tomorrow, right? Kiss my fifth place. It was an unusual funeral because both Clayton and his wife, Emily, were from outside the area. I don't know why she decided to bury him here and not in their hometown. The only thing that came to my mind was that she was upset about the circumstances of his death and did not want to explain it to her friends and family. Most of the people were from the office where Donna and Clayton worked. At the end of the ceremony, people walked past the widow, expressing their condolences. As we got closer, Emily sent the boys away. Donna held out her hand, and Emily looked into her eyes. You have the nerve to come here, you damn. You destroyed my marriage, you destroyed my family, and you have the gall to come here to insinuate yourself into it. If I ever see you again, I will tear you to pieces. This is a promise. Donna looked at her with her mouth open. She didn't know what to say or do. She wanted to say something but changed her mind, turned, and walked to the car. Several people nearby heard all this. I looked at Emily Mankey, who was watching my wife leave. There was hatred in her eyes. I'm very sorry if she offended you in any way. I'm sure it wasn't intentional. Oh, grow up. She cheated on you, and you defend her? What kind of weakling are you? Go comfort your... You're just annoying me, and I don't need that right now. I nodded slightly at her and walked back to the car. Donna didn't say anything on the way home, but when we got home, she unloaded on me. Oh, you son of A. Why did you insist that I go to this damn funeral just so they could make me look like a fool? Sorry, but there were a lot of people from your work there. Why did she choose you to attack? Blow it out of your fifth place, clever stupid. She burst into the house, and I didn't hear a word from her for the rest of the day. From then on, I slept in a spare bedroom. I didn't want to have intimate with her anyway, so when she made her decision, I was relieved. The next day, around noon, 
I drove up to Emily Mankey's house. I had no idea what I was going to say, but I felt obligated. She was in the garage with the boys, sorting through some boxes. Hello, sorry to bother you, but I want to apologize for everything I may have done yesterday to upset you. She just looked at me and continued working. Finally, she turned around. Listen, I have a lot to do right now. I have to clean up the mess my husband left behind and then find some way to move on with my life. I just don't have time to listen to whining right now. Can I help with anything? Are you serious? Yes, I have time, and I wouldn't mind helping. Okay, grab a handful of these trash bags and follow me. We entered the house and went upstairs to the master bedroom. This is Clay's closet, and this is his chest of drawers. Take everything out of them and put it in bags. When you're done, you can take them to Goodwill. Can you handle this? Certainly can. The boys, Josh and Terry, this is Mr. Powers. Help him put daddy's things into bags so we can get rid of them. Fine. The boys shook my hand. Josh was about eight years old, and Terry was six. These were two great-looking kids that I would give anything for. It took less than an hour, and the guys and I were dragging bags of clothes and shoes to the Hummer. I took center and returned home. So, what now? It's okay, Mr. Powers. You don't need to do anything else. You shouldn't feel obligated just because of what your wife did. Do you know exactly what they did, or is it just a guess? A little bit of both, but I don't want to talk about it in front of the boys. Could we discuss this later? Come tomorrow. I need to clean out the basement and garage. If you don't mind working while we talk. The boys have a meeting with school friends. Sounds good, but I'll miss the guys. When I left, I felt a little better. I felt bad for killing Emily's husband, but I think he deserved it. I think Emily felt the same way. I had no idea what to do with Donna. I don't know why she resisted the divorce. When I got home, my wife was making chili. I decided to try to get her to open up a little before we sat down at the table. Donna, in light of what's happened over the last few days, wouldn't it be best for us to think about separating? No, not at all. I think it's pretty clear now that you and Clayton were having an affair. I guess you were unhappy with our union. Would you like to try to explain this to me? I don't have much to say, Brian. After spending some time with Clay, both at work and otherwise, I realized that your idea of our future together did not match what I was looking for. You imagined me as a domestic goddess bearing children left and right, but I wanted something more. I was hesitant to discuss this with you because I never wanted to say or do anything that would make you unhappy. Clay had the same problem with Emily. She wanted what you wanted, and I wanted what Clay wanted. We ended up comforting each other, and then the intimate started. He wasn't better than you, just different. Doesn't divorce seem appropriate now? In no case. I'm not going to give up my home and all the comforts of marriage just because we disagree. I intend to stay here. You can't kick me out because I didn't do anything to justify it. I don't think you'll leave, so we'll just have to get used to living in the same house together and acting like a married couple. Sit down and eat. There was no conversation at dinner. I swallowed two portions because I found the sauce especially hot. About two hours later, I started having stomach pains. I made several trips to the bathroom and finally started vomiting. Donna, I feel very bad. Can you take me to the emergency room? Hell no. The Desperate Housewives series is just around the corner. If your stomach hurts, take Tums. It's more than a stomach ache. Donna, let's please go. It's serious. You're behaving childishly. I grabbed the keys and went to the car. My neighbor was taking out the trash and asked me what happened. I explained, and he took me to the emergency room. The next thing I remember is waking up and looking at the sun coming through the window. I turned to look the other way and saw Detective Green reading a magazine. Good afternoon, Mr. Powers. I thought you'd sleep all day. What the hell are you doing here? What happened, and what time is it? Hello, guy. I'm the one who asks questions. Calm down, okay? Sorry if I'm a little worried, understandable given the circumstances. Brian, 
I think you got some bad chili last night. Luckily, your neighbor got you here on time. They had to pump you out and give you a bunch of weird pills that I can't pronounce. What the hell was that they gave me? They gave me a fancy name, but it was basically rat poison. That's... What did she say? Well, she gave us some leftover chili, and everything was fine. She claimed she has no idea where the poison might have come from. She ate the same food as you and was fine. We searched the house and garage and found nothing. So, what are you going to do? Nothing yet. About this time, the doctor came in with a nurse. He checked a bunch of things while the nurse took another blood sample. He said I could go home when I was ready and gave me a paper with a list of some bland food. I borrowed Detective Green's phone number and called Emily to apologize for not coming to her aid. Felix took the phone. Why does your wife want to kill you, Mr. Powers? I don't know. Why did she kill Clayton Mankey? Do you know that for sure? No, but she was on Rainbow Mountain and was the last person to see him alive. Come on, Brian, I'll take you home. Donna was in tears when we got home and apologized over and over again for not being more responsive to my problem. I walked into the spare room and closed the door behind me. After that, I didn't need it home anymore. The next day, I told Marge that I would be on sick leave and asked her to try to find me an apartment. Somehow, she found out what happened. I waited until Donna left for work and then started packing some things so I could move out quickly if necessary. I was a little upset that the police couldn't do anything about the poisoning. After grabbing a quick breakfast at IHOP, I stopped by Emily's place. The boys were at school. Emily was more upset about what happened than Donna. I promised her that I would return later when I had settled some personal matters. Donna didn't want a divorce, but she wanted me dead. This meant one of two things, revenge or money. I stopped to see my insurance agent. It was probably stupid, but soon after we got married, I took out a million dollar life insurance policy with Donna as the beneficiary. The payouts were high, and cash already exceeded $116,000. I cashed them out. I went to work and canceled the health and dental insurance I had for Donna. I changed the beneficiary of my company's insurance policies to my mother. Marge was glad to see me and offered any help she could. The bank manager told me that Donna had already cleared out the balance of the house fund, about $12,000. I explained the situation to him, and he agreed to arrange everything so that he could close the credit cards. I opened a new account and signed a bunch of papers for it. I turned towards the house. Donna was there, dressed in her bird clothes. We were polite to each other but not too warm. She said she was going up Rainbow Mountain to do some bird watching and relax. It seemed to me that I was being set up, but I decided to play along. Soon after she left, I was already riding a motorcycle. Her car was parked in the upper parking lot next to a gray Ford Ranger. I quickly circled the mountain and headed towards the lower section. Her mountain bike was chained to a tree on the side of the road. Donna was standing behind a rock ledge, talking to a guy who was carrying a small shotgun a pistol with a pistol grip instead of a butt. While I watched, she handed him a photograph in a business size envelope. He looked at the photograph carefully, then opened the envelope and counted the large sum of money. They shook hands, and Donna quickly walked straight towards me. I quickly ducked behind a small ledge and silently waited for her to pass. The man she was talking to squatted behind some rocks to watch the trail leading from the parking lot. He was waiting, and I was quite sure what exactly Donna expected. Me to follow her and assume that I would come from the lot where she had parked the car. It was faster to go down the path than to go up. When I went downstairs, I saw that her bike had disappeared. I went up to the top parking lot. The Ford was unlocked. There was a tracksuit on the front seat. I took out the registration card from the glove compartment, a pack of matches from the center console, and sweatpants. I twisted them as tight as I could and dropped them into the gas tank, lit the end, and got out of there as fast as I could. Halfway down, I heard an explosion. I hope she gave him enough money to cover it. I may have broken a few traffic rules on my way home, but I had to take the back roads to avoid running into Donna. After parking the bike behind the garage, I took out the fertilizer spreader and started pushing it back and forth across the lawn. A few minutes later, my wife came outside and saw me. 
A disappointed expression appeared on her face. Then her cell phone rang. She turned away, answering the call. I couldn't make out the conversation, but it seemed to me that the person on the other end of the line was excited about something. Brian, I left the Volvo in the mountains and decided to warm up a little by cycling home. I know this sounds stupid, but could you give me a ride back to pick up the car? She didn't say anything on the way. To pick up the car, she played with her fingers in her lap. She was clearly worried about something. As we approached the mountain road, we saw a group of fire engines climbing to the top. We were about halfway up when a policeman stopped us. I'm really sorry, guys, but there was an accident at the top of the mountain. The truck caught fire. We can't let anyone in there now. My wife's car is parked there. Can we come and get it? Wait a minute. We sat in silence while he talked to someone on the phone. Okay, you can go upstairs and an officer will lead you past the fire trucks. Donna looked at me as she stepped out of the Hummer. Now you can go home. I'll be okay. Thanks for the help, she said. I simply nodded at her. When she was out of sight, I followed her. It was easy because of all the commotion. When she got to the top, the guy she was with on the trail walked up to her, waving his arms. Of course, I didn't hear anything, but it was clear that she was trying her best to calm him down. They argued for about ten minutes, and then he walked up to the fire chief and said something. When he and Donna got into the Volvo, I hurried back to the Hummer. It would take them a while to get all the fire trucks and hoses up and running, but I still had to hurry. As I drove out, I saw Volvo turning the corner. I drove home but immediately left in the Honda. I went to Emily. I had to apologize for being late, and she insisted that I tell her everything. She seemed interested, although I toned down the story a little. Josh and Terry were happy to see me and happily ordered pizza for dinner. We spent a couple of hours getting things out of the basement for the yard sale. The guys worked tirelessly and did not complain about anything. I wanted them to be mine. I asked Emily to take me home around 9 o'clock and left the bike with her. Donna returned home late. I didn't ask where she was. Early the next morning, while Donna was taking a shower, I removed the SIM chip from her mobile phone. I went to the cell phone office and terminated her service and paid a $200 cancellation fee. At the end of the day, landlines will be turned off, as will DSL and cable television. I notified the landlord that I was moving out and mentioned that my wife could stay, and that he should contact her about a new lease. Water and electricity will be turned off at the end of the week. It only took a few minutes to load my things into the Hummer, and I was on my way to the apartment Marge had found. Marge left a note saying Detective Green asked me to call him. I went down to the station and found his office. So, Mr. Powers, you're still alive. And what is this supposed to mean? Felix Green laughed softly. He seemed to enjoy my dilemma. Do you know a man named Bobby Terrell? I can honestly say that I have never met this man, I replied. I put my hand in my pocket and handed him the Ford registration number. He looked at the form and said, very interesting. We both laughed. Mr. Terrell and your wife have been talking on the phone a lot lately. She called him six times, and he called her four times in the last week. In addition, three days ago, she withdrew $122,000 from her savings account. Bobby Terrell is an ex-convict who makes a living by killing people. We kind of followed him and were surprised when we noticed this connection. Is there any particular reason why your wife wants you dead, Mr. Powers? That was until yesterday morning when I canceled a million dollar life insurance policy. She doesn't know about this. No, Bobby is good at what he does, and I'm impressed with how you handled it. I'm guessing he's already been paid, but I don't know if he'll try to honor the contract since he lost his truck. I just wanted to let you know that he and I spoke. I told him that if anything happens to you in the near future, I will take him away immediately. We also recommended that he take some time off. However, I'm not sure this will discourage your wife. I moved out of the house. I don't know what else I can do. Felix leaned back in his chair. I think you're not telling me something, Brian. All parts do not fit together. Just be careful. I immediately went to Emily. She agreed to go to lunch, and I was glad she liked sushi. 
I tried to explain to her what was happening, but it was too cryptic. There was so much I wanted to tell her, but I couldn't. From time to time, she would throw puzzled glances at me, and instead of explaining, I would change the subject. It was a long lunch. That evening, she had no difficulty persuading me to come to dinner. I apologized to her for the utter nonsense, but she just laughed. I felt comfortable with her. The next morning, I decided I was ready to get back to work. Last night, I had a good time with Josh and Terry. Emily and I had been planning a big weekend together, and I was looking forward to it. It's funny, I didn't miss Donna at all. I was actually relieved that I wouldn't have to face her anymore. It was only a short drive to work, and I pulled out of the Hummer with a big smile on my face. Things were going well. The big monster quickly picked up speed, but as I started going down the first hill, I noticed something strange. The brakes didn't respond at all. I've seen movies where this happened, and I always thought how stupid the drivers were because they couldn't stop the car. The Hummer was going faster. I calmly grabbed the gear lever and shifted it from drive to low. This caused the bolt to roll and release, but it continued to gain speed. I was approaching traffic in multiple intersections. Now I was going much faster. On the left side was a cemetery with a grassy mound extending up from the street. I turned and simultaneously pressed the handbrake. The Hummer spun 180 degrees and flipped over. Everything went dark. There was no pain. The second time I woke up in a hospital room, I heard myself groan and felt some movement around me. At that same moment, the nurse looked into my eyes, and then there was even more commotion in the room. Now there was pain, a lot of pain. I was glad that I was getting attention, but at the same time, I wanted everyone to leave me alone. How confusing. Finally, it turned out that someone tall had arrived, a qualified doctor, as I had assumed. I hardly opened my eyes and looked around the room. White coats flashed around, but Emily was sitting on the edge of the bed. I felt better. There was a lot of tweaking and testing, and suddenly, I fell asleep. The next time I woke up, everything was quiet. I tried not to make any noise because I wanted to avoid the commotion. I slowly opened my eyes and looked outside. It was night, and everything was relatively calm. There was no one in the room except Emily, who was sleeping in a chair by the bed. My whole body ached. I turned my head to Emily. Hey, are you awake? She looked up and smiled. No, I sleep soundly in dreams. Thank you for coming. No problem. I closed my eyes and fell asleep again. When morning came, I woke up normally, but the pain continued. There was a whole medical team in the room, but Emily was not there. I didn't expect to see her at all. The doctors were full of questions. Does it hurt? Can you see it? I answered all their questions. I asked about Donna. She showed up at the hospital to sign admission forms but has not been seen since. I was in the hospital for two days before I woke up. Emily was there every day. Felix Green checked on my condition daily. I had a concussion, a broken collarbone, a broken left arm, and three broken ribs. There were various internal injuries, but nothing life-threatening. What bothered them most was that I had been unconscious for two days. I was damn hungry, and finally, someone brought me soup. I was able to eat and drink some ginger ale. Felix appeared a little later. I thought you were watching my back. Sorry we didn't notice that. Do you have any idea what happened? Well, someone cut all the brake lines on the Hummer and then disconnected the airbags, front and side. You went through the windshield, and your seat belt broke three of your ribs. It's good that nothing caught fire. The bad thing is that the Hummer is broken. Damn it, I didn't like him anyway. I just bought it to spite Donna. Speaking of your wife, do you know where she is? I haven't seen her since the accident. They said she signed the admission forms here at the hospital. How did she decide to do this? I went and picked her up. This didn't make her too happy. After signing all the papers, the uniformed officer took her home. I asked if she wanted to see you, and she said there was no need. Well, it looks like you saw her after me. Has she left town? We came and looked at everything. There was a lot of money in the purse, 
almost $88,000 she left behind, her driver's license, credit cards, and all her personal belongings. I don't think she left town empty-handed. We just think she's missing. Any idea who damaged the Hummer? We have no idea. Bobby Terrell. Believe it or not, Bobby Terrell was in a hospital in Philadelphia. It looks like he was captured by a couple of thugs and taken into Philadelphia. They explained to him that they didn't want anything to happen to you. Who do you know in Philadelphia, Brian? Crap, Felix, I don't know anyone in Philadelphia. Honestly, I have no idea who you're talking about. I believe you. Listen, I have to run. If you need anything, let me know. After Felix left, Emily came in. Hello, the doctor said that you can go out tomorrow if you have somewhere to go. I told him that you would come to me. One of the nurses gave me instructions, so I know how to take care of you. I can change your bandages and stuff. The nurse will come once a day to see how things are going, and the doctor will see you in a week. Okay, sounds good to me. Who will give me a sponge bath? You are the visiting nurse. I think it's your choice. At least both my legs were working. I could go to the bathroom alone, sit down, and eat at the table like a normal person. The painkiller made me nauseous, so I tried to wean myself off it as quickly as possible. Emily and the boys were delighted. I enjoyed my recovery. We didn't go outside for the first week, and then I told her to drive up to the old house. The owner was there, and he was eager to talk. He hadn't heard anything about Donna and wanted to know what to do about renting a house. Our things and her things were there. He needed them removed so he could rent out the house. We agreed in such a way that it suited both of us. Marge came to visit me at Emily's house. She visited the hospital every day and knew Emily quite well. Looks like they hit it off. I was planning on going back to work, but I wanted to stay with Emily and the boys a little longer. I recovered quite well. I stayed with Emily and the boys. After about three months, the relationship changed from platonic to romantic. I moved into the bedroom without much fanfare. Josh and Terry seemed to think it was natural. We went to social events together. I even started going to parent-teacher conferences. The only problem was that we weren't married. I was married to Donna. I contacted Felix regularly, but he had no news. I ended up going to court to have her declared legally dead so I could marry Emily. I took her to a small romantic Italian restaurant. After a good bottle of wine and a great meal, I was ready. Emily, I know it hasn't been that long for either of us, but I seriously believe that I would like to spend the rest of my life with you. Are you thinking about getting married? Is this a hypothetical question, or are you making a proposal? I'm making an offer. Will you marry me? Yes, but we have one small problem. What exactly? You should meet my family in Philadelphia. What do you think of the wife's behavior? How would you react if you were the husband? Write your opinion in the comments. See you in the next video.